invite you to pray with me. <clears throat> Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you so much for your presence here with us today. We want to thank you for your healing touch thank you, yes. and for your constant presence in our lives. Oh, yes. Yes. And Lord, I pray today that as we open your word, that as we seek to grow in you, Lord, that you would turn our hearts completely to you. And Lord, may we be ready to meet you when you come. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin by talking about a gentleman by the name of Desmond Doss. Some of you may know who he is. Um, he is a Seventh-day Adventist. We passed away some years ago in 2006. But he was one of the first conscientious objectors in military war. Um, many of you know he, he refused essentially to bear arms um, to, to fight anybody and to engage in killing anyone, even in war, even protecting his country, although he wanted to serve for his country. And so he enlisted into the army and letting them know right up front that he was a seven-day Adventist, that he would need to keep his Sabbath, and that he would not bear arms. Got into the military, and of course the military at that time to not bear arms, then to want a day off for your religious purposes, was not taken very lightly. It became so bad, particularly because he would not bear arms, that many of his own platoon turned against him. He became ostracized, he became isolated, and things got so bad for him that at, at one point the military actually tried to give him a dishonorable discharge because of his conviction and loyalty to Christ Jesus. And he was excited. He had a Bible with him, and he would spend most of his time reading and reflecting on the Bible, and he was convicted. And more than anything, he wanted to be loyal to Jesus Christ, but his convictions clashed with what the military wanted from him. And so we begin to see something emerging that his experience of serving God was one that was both bitter and sweet. Yeah, yeah. It was sweet because he was filled with love of Christ and was more, than deter more determined than ever to live for him, but it was bitter because of the opposition that he received. But interestingly, after going to war, Desmond Doss became one of the most revered military um, combatants ever. The reason being that although he went onto the battlefield, he did not have any weapons, that he rescued in one the space of one night 75 men who had been wounded and left for dead. He was the first non-combatant um, conscientious objector to receive a medal of honor. No one else has ever received that for being a medic in the military. And so what we begin to see is that serving Jesus does cause us to be excited in our commitment to him. But sometimes our commitment brings hostility and opposition. But just like Desmond received the reward, I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that when we are committed to Christ, we are going to receive an eternal reward that no one will ever be able to take away from us when we live with Jesus Christ forever. So today, I want to talk to you on a sermon entitled, Bittersweet. Bittersweet. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 10. And I want to read in your hearing, starting in verse 8 from the New King James Version of the Bible. And I want to read all the way to verse 11. Revelation chapter 10, starting in verse 8, and I want to read in your hearing verses 8 through 11. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, 
Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. I want you to keep your Bibles handy because I'm going to be moving a little bit here through Scripture today, so keep your Bibles close by. But I want you to begin by letting you know that this scene in Revelation marks a major turning point in the book of Revelation. We see this vivid description. If you remember earlier in chapter, in chapter 10, we see an angel that is standing with one foot on the land and one foot in the water, and he's holding up in his hand this little book that is open. Now, we have to remember that in the book of Revelation that it is a book that is written by Jesus. It's a message from Jesus about himself, and it is, and it is, it is directed to particularly to his church, his believers, his followers who are living in the last days. It is a message for the last day church. Hear me now. But also we must begin to understand that if we remember the book of Revelation, that the book of Revelation is a unique book in that it is a prophetic book in that it is a book that reveals to the believers everything that is going to happen just before Jesus comes again. In this book, we find the answer. God unveils for us like the name Revelation means. It opens our eyes into what God's plan is to save his people just before he comes and everything that will take place. It is interesting that in this book we we, we find as we unfold this message today that starting in chapter 10 and following that we discover that God begins to unveil his final warning message to every person that is living in this world. But not only that, God is seeking to what we find in this, in this little scroll that we're about to unpack here today, we'll find that it contains messages that until now had never been before revealed to anybody. Stay with me now. What we begin, what John begins to experience, what he begin, what he's beginning to write in this second half of the book of Revelation, he is unfolding for us. God is opening his eyes to some things that until now the people of God did not know would happen as we came to the end, as we come to the end of time. It is particularly, hear me now, it is particularly, it is the unveiling, it is the unsealing of the book of Daniel, particularly Daniel chapter 12. For those of you who remember in the book of Daniel chapter 12, Daniel, the prophet Daniel, has a vision that he does not understand. And it is a vision of the end, the, the, the angel tells him, God tells him. But, but he does not understand what it is. And he says, how long will these things be before it happens? And the angel, and God tells him, he says, I want you to seal up the book. It's not for you to understand until the end. But now we see in the book of Revelation, with the little book being opened, we see God now unsealing, pulling back the curtains on what has been hidden since many years, hundreds of years prior. If we look at the book of Daniel chapter 12, I want to connect it. If you think about it, you see the same imagery that we know there's a connection because we see this angel um, and how he's dressed holding a little book. But then we go to Daniel chapter 12. Go with me there quickly. Daniel chapter 12. And I want to read verses 7 through 9. Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of river... When he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times and a half time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Now, next week's sermon, we're going to unpack a lot of this in more detail. 
Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the end, till the time of the end. And so Revelation now is the unsealing of that. But we also begin to see here that, that the unsealing, the content of the message that John is getting ready to see and communicate to the church living in the last days. And, and chapter verse 10 here of Daniel lets us know the content of that message. Notice what he says. He says, many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And hear me now, we begin to understand that this final message that, is be, that will be revealed to the last day church just before Jesus come, it will be a message that purifies the people of God. It is a message that will refine. In other words, it is a message that will expose the wickedness in the hearts of men, but it will also have a purifying effect. It will cause people, those who belong to Christ Jesus, to respond in faith and be transformed by the power of his message. Yes, Jesus says that my sheep hear my voice. Later in the book of John, he says that those who are of the truth, they hear what I say and they follow me. And so the last day message that will be proclaimed in the earth will only be received by those who know Jesus, who belong to him, whose hearts are open to him. And the person who belongs to him, who is willing to allow their sins to be confronted and exposed, Jesus will save them. Yes, sir. Amen. But notice the flip side. Those who reject him, Daniel calls them the wicked. He says they will persist in their wickedness. They will not understand what is being communicated to them. The last day message is a bittersweet message. Hmm? That is why John says, it was sweet as honey in my mouth and bitter in my belly. Are you all with me today? I want you to go back quickly to Revelation chapter 10. I want to read what he says about this message. Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10, verse 10. And notice what he says. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Hmm? And so it is a message that brings excitement and peace and assurance. He enjoys what the message is, but when he digests it, when he begins to understand the full implications of what is being revealed in this little book, it becomes bitter in his stomach. And I want us to begin to understand the symbolism and what John is trying to communicate here to us. He is saying that this message must, one, be eaten, chewed, and digested. Oh, you're not with me today. There is in one sense in which we can hear the word of God. We can even become excited and say, yes, Jesus is coming again. But if we do not internalize the gospel, yes. if we do not chew on God's word and what he has to say, even the parts of the gospel that we don't like or don't agree with our nature, he says, even if we, when we digest all the gospel has to say, then we will be prepared to meet Jesus Christ when he comes. And many of us, the reason why many of us will be lost when Jesus comes is because we only liked the, the sweet things of the gospel. We did not like the parts of the gospel that demanded that we surrender and forsake all for the kingdom of God. And the last day message is not a feel-good message. Oh, you're not with me today. It is not a message that, 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 that spouts from the pulpit that says everything is going to be all right. That's not what the Bible says. 
And as we get into Revelation in these next few weeks, we're going to begin to see that everything will not be all right, especially for the person that does not give their heart for Jesus Christ. But even for the person who decides to live committed and faithful to God, they will have to suffer because of their loyalty to him. It will be a bittersweet experience for every person that decides to be radically committed to Jesus Christ. And it is not a message that many of us want to embrace We want a superficial faith, but not a deep, abiding faith. I want to go to Ezekiel because we see this imagery reinforced and explained even more. So you can see that I'm not just making this up. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 2. I want to begin there. Ezekiel chapter 2, that's right before Daniel. Ezekiel chapter 2. And I want to read... Starting in verse 8 and 10, and then we're going to go into chapter 3, just a couple of verses there. Ezekiel chapter 2, 2, and let's look at verse 8. We'll start there. Verse 8. All right, here we go. My page is sticking together here. Okay, here we go. Here we go. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be, do not be rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. (laughs) Oh, you're not with me today. He's saying, I have a message for you to give. And don't be like the people who don't want to hear it. Eat what I give you. Whatever you find in my word, whatever I communicate to you, you eat it. You devour it completely. Oh, you're not with me today. Hmm? The same way we like to devour black eyed peas, candied yams. And collard greens is the same way Jesus wants us to devour his word. Notice what he goes on to say, verse 9. Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was a writing on the inside, on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. And so the message that he has For Ezekiel to proclaim, it is a message of lamentation that will bring mourning. It is a message of warning and woe. Let's go to verse 10. Chapter 3, moreover, he said to me, son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat the scroll. Do you guys see the connection here, right? And he said to me, son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll and and digest this. Allow my word to become a part of you. So I ate it and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. Then he said to me, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. You know, it's interesting if you read particularly the book of Ezekiel, there's one point when God is telling him what he has to say. And it's so, it is going to be so terrible what he has to say that Ezekiel goes into depression and God gives him seven days just to recover from what he has to say. That's how deep it was for him. Hmm? That's how, he, that's how uh, confrontational the gospel was going to be. And so what we see here in Revelation and what John is getting ready to begin to unfold is really what he's calling for is calling the people of God back to his word, back to Christ that can only be accomplished when we are willing to receive and digest All that Jesus says about himself and his kingdom, including his prohibitions and his warnings. See, we love the parts of the Bible that says increase, enlarge my territory. But we don't like the parts of the Bible that says be zealous and repent. And this, what, what, what John is communicating and what he's going to unfold in Revelation is what 
is going to what it's going to take for the people of God to be ready to meet Jesus when he comes. That's the only way is if God confronts us with his word. The only way that our lives can come back in alignment and agreement with Jesus Christ. The only way that our hearts can be transformed is through submission and the study of the word of God. That's the only way that revival is going to take place. They say statistics, um, um, surveys and people have conducted research say that this is the most biblically illiterate generation of them all. They say this generation, they believe in the Bible, but they don't read it and they don't study it and they don't live by it. They put their opinions and their experience above the word of God. And we don't understand that in order for revival to take place, it is a return to God's word. If you look in the Old Testament, the history of, of revival in the Old Testament, that, the, that, that apostasy or when the people turn away from God, when God is not in the midst of the people, is when they are ignorant of the word of God. They say that today that some people believe that Joan, the Joan of Ark was Noah's wife. Most people can't even name all 12 of the disciples. They can name maybe three of them. That's the generation we're living in. We're living in a generation that is ignorant of the word of God. And whenever the word of God is not central, we don't study it. We don't know it. It always leads to rebellion against God. And we may not Be like a drug addict or a prostitute on the street, but we may be self-sufficient following our own way apart from God and be just as lost as the crack addict. As a matter of fact, they might even be in a better position than us because they at least know they're a crack addict and they need some help. But when we are self-sufficient... We don't even know that we need Jesus. We don't even know that he's missing. And so what we discover here is that in the last days, the last day church will think they have God and he will be on the outside knocking, trying to get in. And the only way that revival can take place, the only way that God can revive and renew his people is for his people to turn to him through his word and repent. I love what John says. He says it was as sweet as honey. Huh? Let's go to um, Psalms 19. Move quickly here. I got five minutes, right? (laughs) Psalms 19. Psalms 19, quickly, talking about how sweet the word of God. We see the word of God, it brings assurance, it brings acceptance, it brings us to salvation, but there's another dimension that we often negate. Um, Psalms 19, verse 10, I want to read this here. It says, talking about the word of God, this is David now, celebrating the word of God, right? He says, the word of God, starting in verse 10, is more to be desired are they than gold. Oh, you're not with me today. Some of us, our life's mission, our life's journey is to become a mogul, is to become rich, is to to win the lottery. But here we see that David was consumed. He says, your word is more precious than all of the money in the world. And he goes on to say, he says, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey on the honeycomb. Mm, The word of God is sweet. Because it reveals Jesus Christ to us. It reveals to us the way of salvation and his incredible love for us. But listen what he says. Here's the reason why he gives why it's so sweet. He says, moreover, by them your servant is warned. He says, the word of God is sweet because it warns me when I'm walking off of the path. Oh, y'all not with me today. That's why God gives you your word. You think that he's confronting you because he doesn't want you to have a good time? He doesn't want you to have any joy or any pleasure? No, he's confronting you because he's trying to save your behind. He knows you're going to be lost if he does not confront you with his word. So when we read his word, even when we get to the parts that we don't agree with, 
We need to submit and follow. Because he's trying to save us. Notice what he says. And in keeping them, there is great reward. There is eternity with God. When we begin to digest the full implications of the word of God, we realize that he is calling us to a radical commitment, abandonment, where now we would rather have him than have our idols. <laughs> An idol is any person, place, or thing that we love more than Jesus Christ. An idol is any person, place, or thing that has more influence over our life than Jesus. Oh, y'all not with me today. Anything in your life that you would rather do than spend time with Jesus is an idol. Oh, y'all not with me. Hmm? Hmm? Anytime you feel God calling you to study his word, he's calling you to fellowship with him. He said, Lord, let me watch my favorite show. I'll talk to you after it's done. Whenever what our friends have to say have more influence than what God says, then it's an idol. Anything that we love more than him. And it is an interesting is that many of us, the reason why we only stay with just a superficial relationship with God, because we understand the ramifications and the implications of what it means. We understand that he's going to call us to a place that we are not comfortable. And so we try to justify, we try to stay around him because we still want some of his benefits, but our hearts don't belong to him. When our hearts belong to him, then we will do and say and live for him no matter what he says. That's the kind of relation we're calling. But some of us, we only follow God for his benefits. You know, I love, I love the story in the book of John, John chapter 6. I'm going to summarize it for you. But it's after Jesus feeds the 5,000 with the loaves and the fish, right? And I don't know if I mentioned this recently, but um, they, they, the people were so excited. When, when they woke up the next morning, Jesus was gone. They were so excited that they got in boats and sailed across the sea so that they could find Jesus. And when they found him, it wasn't because of who Jesus was, but it was because of what Jesus could do for them. And so Jesus says, you're only following me because I fed you and your stomachs are filled. You're only following me because of the blessings of provision that I'm going to give to you. But you're not following me because of me. And you know what Jesus does? He tests their faith. He says, if you will be my disciple, you've got to drink my blood. You've got to eat my flesh. In other words, you've got to have all of me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Amen. And the Bible says that when he made that proposition, that those people turned away and followed him no more because what Jesus was calling them to, the life that he was calling them to was not a life that they wanted to live. They did not want to experience trial or suffering. But let me tell you something. If you're going to live in the last days of earth's history, if you're going to be a loyal follower of Jesus Christ, you are going to experience trial and suffering. But the trial and suffering is for the purpose of God being formed in us for us to become completely in love with him. If there were never any trials, you would not have the faith to hold on to him. I was reading in a book, devotional, really just this morning. And then they compared about in the book he has, there's a flower that he saw on the mountaintop. And this flower was just was just um, the brightest yellow. Its, its, its leaves were green. It was, just, it, was just, it was just flourishing in the sunlight. And where he was on the top of the mountain peak was a place where frequented by storms and rain. It, it had no shelter, but yet after the storm and the rain passed, there was this flower shining as brightly as ever. But the same flower was down in a valley that was covered by shade, but it was not as bright. 
It never had to deal with the outside elements. It never had to experience any growing pains. Therefore, it was alive, but it was dull in its appearance. And my brothers and sisters, the work of God when he deals with us in suffering and trials is to cause us to perfectly reflect his character and his glory. And the only way to really know who Jesus is is to have to rely on him. And so he brings us to the place where we must rely on him. Getting ready to make my final, my final two points. Final two points. Final point is that the word of God not only is a challenge to us, but it also creates hostility with those in the world and even with those in the church. Dare I say that the fiercest opposition to the word of God, when we're trying to live faithful to God, will not come from the world. But it will come from people who profess his name but don't have his word. And what we must understand is that when we are loyal to Jesus Christ, we will experience opposition and hostility. Why? Because Satan in the last days is going to employ every tactic imaginable to blind the minds of men and harden the hearts of men against the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when you come trying to live faithful and talk about Jesus is getting ready to come again, they're going to hate you because Lucifer is blinding their minds and hardening their hearts. And when we try to be faithful to him, no matter how excited we are about his word, he brings, he brings trial and opposition. One last text, one last text. Um, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I want to kind of show that Jeremiah chapter 15, go over there quickly. Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah chapter 15. I want to go there quickly. Jeremiah was a prophet of God, as we know. And I want to read verse 16, Jeremiah. And notice again here, notice what he says. He says, your words were found and I ate them and your words to me, the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. For I'm called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. So when he, he finds God's word, he's excited and he rejoices. But look what happens in a couple chapters later, verse 20, chapter 20, verse 7, 7 and 8. One minute he's happy and he's celebrating. Then he says, O Lord, you induced me. And I was persuaded, you're stronger than I. I have prevailed and, 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 and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. I'm a laughing stock. When I spoke, I cried out. I shouted violence and plunder. When I said your message, because of the word of the Lord, was made to me a reproach and a derision. I became a laughing stock. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Even though his, the, the, being faithful to the word of God brought him hostility, he could not turn away because his word was so precious. And that is the place where Jesus is trying to bring us to. And that is the, what he's getting ready to unfold in the, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 10 and following. It's the final message that many people will reject. They will hate us because of our fidelity to God's word. But you know what he says to him in verse 11? He says, prophesy again. Tell them again what I have said finally, I'm getting ready to close, is that this message comes just before the seventh trumpet blows, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so what is happening, we're so close to the end of time that God has no time to mince word. His final message of fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. We're living in the judgment hour and the message, although it is hard and goes against our nature, it is a message of mercy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
It is a message to not only warn the people, but to prepare the hearts of men so that we can be ready to see Jesus when he comes. And so God, as we begin to see, he raises up a last day church Hmm? that will proclaim this message. And I want to suggest to you today that that is the reason why God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church. To be the vehicles of proclaiming the last day message. And it is not something to beat your chest about or to hold your nose up in the air. It is a humbling and a solemn responsibility because how dare us proclaim a message that we're not living And make no mistakes about it. God will use you. And then on that day, he will say, Lord, I did this. He said, I never knew you. So don't take pride in what you know. Submit yourself to God and surrender to Jesus Christ and allow him to fulfill his life in in us. It is only when we know what God requires that there can be genuine revival. Hear me now. Unless the word of God is opened and exposed and taught, then there can be no revival. I don't care how many people attend. If the word of Christ is not central and being proclaimed, if it is only a message of grace but not the discipline of grace, then it is not of God. We cannot use as a means of evaluation as to whether or not a church is successful based on the attendance. For when they were getting ready to go in the promised land, all of the people didn't want to go. If we were to apply that worldly um, um, metric to to the work of God, we would have been, those people would have never made it to the promised land. Are you with me? It was only the minority that belonged to God. The message of God is so cutting that only the completely submitted heart can receive it. In the book of Revelation, there is salvation and judgment. God's justice and God's mercy. Jesus in Revelation is the judge and the Savior. So when we preach Jesus, when we talk about Jesus, make sure we talk about the Jesus that is the Savior, that is forgiving, but the Savior that will warn and discipline. And it is only by submission to him that we can receive him when he comes. I want to close a story I came across. Only Christ, only Christ can save us. 200 years ago, a gentleman by the name of Sir Roger Baller was visiting this town, and while he was in this town, apparently, he went to this fair that they were having. And he was just looking around, and he was having a good time. He was visiting all the different booths, and he was seeing what what they had. And then while he was there, you know, he heard the chime, the, the town clock began to chime. And unconsciously, because he was so into clocks, and that's what he did as a little boy, counting the chimes a number of times, the clock chimed, he started counting the chimes. And then for some reason, the clock chimed 13 times. And that makes sense to me. I guess it's only supposed to chime 12 times. And it went 13 times. And so he got so, he said, did you, he turned to the man next to him, he said, did you hear that? The clock chimed 13 times. I can't believe it. And the man said, yes, I did. I heard it. I can't believe it either. It chimed 13 times. He got so excited, he pulled out a diary that he carries, that he recorded events, dates, and time. And he wrote in there the clock where he was um, in Colchester. He says the clock chimed 13 times. He wrote the date, the time, and what happened. Little did he know what that entry, how significant it would be later on. A couple years later, 
The same man, sir, Roger, was traveling to another town. And when he got to the town, he saw this big scene outside of the courthouse. All these people were out there. And so he went inside to see what was going on. He discovered that they were having a murder trial and they were getting ready to sentence this man for murder. So they brought the man out and he was sitting there. And then the court, the, the judge in the court says, he says, sir, do you have anything that you want to say before we sentence you? And the man says, your honor, I'm innocent. He said, I've been telling you all since this trial began that I am innocent. He says, when this murder took place, I was 100 miles away at a state fair. And the clock chimed 13 times. And there was a man that was there that knew, and he wrote it down in his book, if I could only find that man, you would understand that I'm innocent. And Sir Roger was sitting there, and when he heard that, he stood up. He says, Your Honor, you're right. He's right. He is innocent. Here it is in my diary. The clock did chime 13 times. Here he was. The only man in the world that could save him was Sir Roger. And so it is with us, brothers and sisters. The only person in the world that can save us is none other than Jesus Christ himself. The final warning message is a call to come back to Jesus. You know why? Because he's the only one that can save us. He's the only one. So today I'm going to make an appeal. Anybody here today want to receive Jesus in your heart? You want to be ready when he comes again in the clouds. You want to be ready to meet him. If this is you today, I want to invite you to step out of your seat and come down front. You want to give your heart to Jesus today. He's getting ready to come. And we're going to see in the next few weeks for the rest of this year, this last quarter of the year, we're going to get into a very deep prophetic part of the book of Revelation. And we're going to begin to see how this little book, the content of this book, is being unfolded. But I want you to know the only way that we can be saved, hmm? the only way is to let Jesus in your heart. You can't work for it. You can't guilt yourself into it. Give your heart to him. Respond to him in submission to his word. If you're here today. You've never given your heart to him. You've never been baptized. And you want to be with Jesus when he comes. You want to embrace him today. I want to invite you to slip out of your seat where you are and come and receive him. You want Bible study. You want to be baptized. My second appeal, my second appeal. You want to stand today in recommitment. You want to say, Lord, I want to eat completely your word of God, your word. Your son. I want to receive you completely into my heart. There's some idols in my life. There's some things that have more influence. There's some things that I don't want to do even though it's in your word. There's some things that I've disobeyed that I know was not your will. Lord, I need your forgiveness. I need your mercy. And I want to digest all of you. Even the difficult part. Even the parts that I don't like. You know why? Because when I do them, it is the more I get to know you and it's the more that I'm transformed by you. This is your desire today. I want to invite you to stand where you are. You want to receive Christ and all that he is, all that he has to internalize him in his word and be ready. I want to invite you to stand. Getting ready to close. If you want to give your heart to him, you want to be baptized. Hmm? Only those who have been born again, who have received him, will meet him. Don't be afraid. Every head is bowed, every eyes closed. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you so much for your wonderful goodness. We want to thank you for your word that exposes to us your plan, your will, and your way, and your, your message of warning. Help us to see your warning as a message of mercy. That, that, that your warning message is, is a cry, it's an appeal for us to come to you, to come into the ark of safety. Lord, I pray that we would have the type of conviction and faith that John the Revelator had, that even though he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, all by himself, he was still committed to you. 
Lord, may we have that kind of faith. Lord, we understand that we can't do it by ourselves. We try. We fail. We need more of you. And so today, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for where we have failed. We ask that you would reveal to us those things in our lives that you want us to turn away from. May we surrender to them. And Lord, be with us, Lord, for those of us who are going through a difficult time and trying to reconcile your way with our way. Lord, may we submit to your way, God. May we, under, may we take the sweet and the bitter. Because one day, we will live with you forever, and it will only be sweet pleasures evermore. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's see. You may be seated. For those of you that will need directions to Baron Springs this afternoon, uh, please see Rochelle by the door. Rochelle, where are you? Rochelle? Is Rochelle here? Yeah. Yes, please see Rochelle. Oh, she's in the back. See Rochelle by the door, and she will be able to share with you directions if you're planning to uh, travel to Baron Springs this afternoon. Could you stand with me for the benediction, please? Did the word of God knock on your heart this morning? As we prepare to leave for today, let us remember the sacrifice that Christ made for each one of us. And all he asks in return is for us to share the gospel, his love, with others. Let us remember that people will not believe that the gospel is important if they can't see that it is crucial in our lives. Let us live our lives in such a way that it will draw others to Christ. Yes. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling yes, yes. and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, yes. to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank <laughs> you.